Good afternoon and welcome to the May 18th Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. Um, as a reminder um, for agenda items and questions and comments, please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your mic and call on you to speak. Please make sure you also unmuted on your end. If you have technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. At this time, Melinda, will you list all attendees? If for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Melinda at mstevens at drcog.org so she can add your name for the record. Melinda? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, looks like we have Aaron Busto, Amanda Brimmer, Andrea LaRue, Ben Pierce, Bill Soroy, Brad Calvert, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, Carson Priest, Chris Chauvin, Chris, Chris Hudson, Christopher Montoya, Danny Herman, David Kretzinger, Fabian Viver, Flo Raitano, James Eusen, Jan Rowe, Jeff Dakenbring, Karen Schneiders, Kenneth Johnstone, Kristen Kenyon, Lawrence Talong, Matt Collison, Matthew Helfant, Paul Jesitis, Phil Greenwald, Sangu Lee, Sarah Grant, Stephen Strominger, Steve Cook, Steve Durian, Tim Hester, Tom Reif, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, Melinda Stevens, Emily Lindsay, Jacob Rieger, <coughs> Kent Mormon, Lisa Hood, Robert Spots, Ron Papsdorf, and Todd Cottrell. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Melinda. Uh, we'll now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up your line um, and, and your line will be muted. Um, Melinda, please unmute all participants at this time. Okay, I will do so. And at this time, everyone should be unmuted if anyone needs to speak. Are there any public comments? Are there any hands raised? There are not that I'm seeing at this time. Okay. We'll give it here about 30 more seconds and then we'll close the, uh, I'll have you mute, mute everybody and we'll continue on with our action items. Okay. Yeah, I still don't see any hands raised, so. Okay. Let's move on to action items. Thank you. So our first action item um, today will be, um, or this afternoon, excuse me, will be a discussion on the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program amendments. And Todd, I believe you're presenting on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, this afternoon's item should be fairly quick. There is only one amendment um, for your recommendation this afternoon, uh, and that is to the Region 1 Faster Bridge Enterprise Pool, where CDOT Region 1 proposes to add $34.4 million in Faster Bridge Enterprise funds. Um, the funding will be split um, to include the increased funding to one FY20 project, and add funding and three new pool projects to FY21. Um, so that completes the amendments um, for this cycle and happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Melinda, are there any hands raised that would like to comment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it looks like uh, we do have one from Brian Weimer. Um, so Brian, I'll go ahead and unmute you and you should be able to speak. Okay, my general question is, has to do with the I-76, I-70 bridges, pavement deck design. It looks to be a program. Do we have a list of particular projects that are included in that? Uh, is there anyone on the phone from Region 1 that was, could, could answer that? Uh, it looks like we have Danny Herman. Oh. 
Danny, I've unmuted you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is Danny. I don't have that list in front of me, Brian, but I can get that for you. Okay, hey, thank you. Are there any other hands raised? Um, I'm going to go ahead and put all hands down just in case anyone else has something they'd like to say. Um, any other hands raised, please raise them now. Okay, uh, it looks like uh, we don't have anyone else who has any more questions. Okay, um, we'll entertain a motion at, in a second for approval of this item. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate you would like to make the motion and you will be called on and unmuted to verbally state the motion. Melinda, do we have a motion? Uh, it looks like we do from Brian Weimer. Brian, you should be able to speak and make the motion. Okay, thank you. I'd move approval of this uh, TIP amendment to move forward. It's Thank you, Brian. Melinda, do we have a second? Okay, give everyone a, or see if anyone will make the second for us. Uh, I'm not seeing a second yet. Oh, it looks sure. like uh, we just got one from uh, Jeff Dakedbring. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you now so you can make the second. Yeah. I heard a second on there. Um, is there any discussion? Again, raise your hand if you'd like to discuss further. Yeah. Melinda, are there any additional raise, hands raised? Uh, I see that Jeff raised his hand again. I don't, uh, okay, looks like the hand went away. All right, then I think we're okay. Okay, all right. Um, at this, um, time. Um, I'm going to ask Melinda to unmute the TAC members and alternates uh, representing their members uh, for a verbal vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. And are there any abstentions? Um, passes unanimously then. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to our informational items. And um, the first one will be by Jacob Rieger. He will be uh, um, the next steps for developing the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Jacob. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Todd's staff. Um, I'll be doing this together with a couple of my colleagues, Alvin Bedal Sanchez and our public engagement specialist, Lisa Hood. Um, we want to build on the conversation that we've been having the last couple months here at TAC about um, transitioning from scenario results to kind of looking forward to next steps on um, putting together the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan um, and specifically the fiscally constrained um, component. Um, of the Regional Transportation Plan. So um, if you recall at last month's meeting, um, given that back in March we presented a lot of information, a lot of data, uh, last month we endeavored to not do that. We had a couple handouts, we had some questions, uh, we kind of started a conversation. We wanted to continue that conversation today uh, in the form of, frankly, some very specific proposals that we've put in front of you. Um, this is an informational item, so we're not seeking action, but Hopefully, we'll see how the conversation goes. We can get some virtual consensus um, on moving these specific pro proposals forward um, to RTC and the board. Um, so because of the volume of information, if you've had a chance to look at the staff memo for this, you know, very, uh, very lengthy, very dense with information. So we're going to try a kind of virtual workshop type format. Uh, we have a few slides, really more as visual aids, uh, summarizing what's in the memo. And then we're going to try some Mentimeter um, polling on, on some of this stuff. So with that, um, let's get into the slides. Um, so just what are we discussing today? Um, a few, few very specific things that we want to kind of touch on with you all. Um, we're going to start with just kind of a reminder of, um, kind of what we've heard from the public so far um, in the regional transportation planning process. Um, just as, as that reminder of what we're hearing and how we use that as a springboard to move forward. Um, then we're going to get into specifically talking about proposed major project types and categories for the 2050 RTP. 
Um, then we're going to talk about a proposal for how we go about um, identifying and soliciting uh, candidate projects to start building the fiscally constrained uh, 2050 plan. Uh, we'll start a conversation about project evaluation. There's more to be said uh, about project evaluation, but we'll at least lay the groundwork for that. And then finally, um, we wanted to kind of show some initial revenue uh, numbers that we've been working on with uh, both CDOT and RTD. Um, these are very draft, very much work in progress, not a complete picture yet, um, but a lot of work has gone into this. We appreciate the collaboration with the two agencies. Uh, wanted to just kind of start showing our work on, on some of those initial numbers. Uh, so with that, next slide. Um, so let's start with uh, public engagement. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, on this particular slide, uh, many of you have seen this before. This is actually back from last summer and fall when we did our first real big initial push on public engagement. Um, kind of, you know, what did we hear from the public about what's important to them? Uh, we played an exercise with them where, you know, you have five coins, five buckets. You know, if you, if you were in charge, you were going to spend money on transportation. Um, how would you do it? Um, so again, this is, you know, not scientific, but it's a summary of kind of the pulse of the public. Uh, we also did an online survey um, with similar results on this. So this is just kind of a reminder of what we heard um, to honor that input as we go forward, um, as we get into more technical work uh, later, uh, later in this item. Uh, but again, as you see here from the public, you know, really strong support for uh, transit, sidewalks and bike paths, uh, safety, and then maintenance, and then new roads and more lanes. Go ahead, next slide. Alvin? We've kept this engagement going through our youth advisory panel and our civic advisor group. We've had two meetings with each of these uh, in the last year or the last couple months. Um, back in late February and early March, we asked them to perform a March Madness bracket uh, where we were asking them what they thought the, their priorities were for the outcome assessments we were looking at as we started going through our scenario analysis and our scenario planning. Uh, those are those two pictures you see at the bottom left. And then most recently in late April, early May, we uh, unveiled our online engagement page that you see on the screen for them to test out and troubleshoot to see if we uh, needed to fix anything before we unveiled this to the public. Um, through that, we had them do a budget game. We presented them the outcomes that y'all had also seen, just a more condensed version, and asked them to start funding these scenarios with uh, a very limited budget that we gave them. So uh, we were asking them what they thought the most uh, important priorities for investment were as we started getting into this discussion of project selection. Next slide. When we did our outcome bracket with uh, each of the groups, they both ended up selecting more people have good access to transit and jobs. Uh, the youth caveated that by requesting the transit to be electric transit. Um, the other final four measures that we saw from that included fewer deaths on roads, more electric vehicles, and fewer greenhouse gas emissions. That was one that both groups ended up selecting. And then for the civic advisory group, they also selected more low income people have good access to transit and jobs and more walking and rolling trips. Um, that was similar to what we were hearing from last summer, uh, requesting more improved transit service, uh, more options for folk to walk and bike around the region, and then this uh, importance of safety for all transportation users on the system. When it came to our budget game, um, travel choices and transit were the ones that were selected uh, by both groups overwhelmingly, uh, travel choices most often. And then when it came to the land use scenarios, both were selected pretty similarly, but infill was the one that selected more often of the two. Uh, like Jacob mentioned, we wanted to make sure you were getting this information as we were talking with our groups, but also to help you understand where we were coming from as we started drafting this uh, proposal framework that you're going to see in the next couple slides. Next slide. So I'm handing it back over to Jacob to introduce the project types and categories that we're uh, introducing to you. Thanks, Alvin. So this is our kind of first big technical category of uh, some of the information that's included in um, the staff memo. And the first thing for which we um, want to specifically get your input and, and you know, maybe consensus on the proposal that we put in front of you. Um, so just for some background on this, um, as it says on the slide, and as some of you know, uh, we do have a lot of federal regulations that we're trying to meet here. And one of those federal regulations is that we are required to individually list and illustrate in the Regional Transportation Plan what we call air quality regionally significant capacity projects. Uh, what that means in English is uh, major roadway and rapid transit projects. So uh, new roadways, major roadway widenings, new interchanges, uh, fast tracks type rapid transit investments. Those types of projects we already have to show in the plan. Uh, we have done so, we will continue to do so. The point here is that 
um, there's, as you all know, a lot more to a multimodal transportation system, and there's a lot more to regional priorities than just those two project types. And so we've listed some of those things that uh, we think are regional priorities that we've heard through our planning processes and, and through our partners' planning processes. And I think these are pretty self-evident in terms of things like safety, uh, system condition and operations, um, active transportation, uh, transit service, obviously, as we just talked about. Part of the point here, too, is that um, specifically here at Dr. Cog, and not just Dr. Cog, but our planning partners as well, um, but even just focusing on the work we've been doing at Dr. Cog, you know, you see the list of, of kind of plans and things we've been working on over the last year or two, you know, really a comprehensive suite of, of planning work that we've done uh, from the Mobility Choice Blueprint, which looked at technology, um, our active transportation plan. Um, this week, uh, in fact, in two days, our board will uh, be taking action potentially on adopting our regional vision zero action plan, our multimodal freight plan, and then as part of the 2050 RTP, we're also working on a coordinated transit plan. So all of these, you know, all these things are are plans that you know Dr. Cog has led, but you all have participated in. These are things that we feel like should be reflected in priorities and how we convey what the region's investment priorities are in the 2050 RTP. Next slide. Alvin? So like Jacob mentioned, this first two line of projects, our roadway capacity and our rapid transit capacity projects, we're going to be included, are going to be included in the RTP regardless. What we really want to have a discussion on with y'all are these four within the blue box, our multimodal safety, active transportation, regional transportation operations and technology, and freight and goods movement projects. Uh, these are tied to some specific plans from the memo. Um, each of these has steps for implementing their plans. Uh, either looking at specific corridors or geographic areas of focus. So being able to leverage the findings in each of those plans for these project types. And then the last one you see on the screen, Other. Um, this is an all-encompassing plan. So there are also projects that are just by default going to be included as we develop the regional transportation plan. Uh, one big one would be maintenance, what it takes to, how much it costs, what it takes to maintain and operate our system efficiently. But uh, for this part of the presentation, we really want to focus discussion on these four proposals, project types that we're including. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to start facilitating that discussion through our Mentimeter activity. So Alvin, just, just before we do that, just to make the really specific point here of what we're asking for before we get into this activity. Um, again, we're federally required to show a couple of these project types in the RTP. Uh, we have done so, we will continue to do so. The question before us here is that to reflect regional priorities, what we're really asking about is these four proposed project types in the blue box, are these worth kind of elevating um, to a level of either showing specific projects or at least project types, maybe geographies. We tried to explain those in the memo of kind of our thinking on that. But the question is, are these, are these important enough? Are these regional priorities important enough that they should be elevated a little bit in terms of how they're, how they're dealt with in the regional transportation plan? So it's not so much changing what we've always done per se. It's more, it's more bringing to bear and bringing um, bringing forward, you know, communication about what the region's priorities are rather than just listing a couple types of projects that we're required to and showing everything else in terms of financial plan tables. Is it worth drawing these four out um, a little bit more in terms of how we, how we display them and how we talk about them in the RTP? All right. I am Lisa Hood. Um, I am going to help facilitate this Mentimeter exercise. We, uh, as Jacob mentioned, there's a lot to discuss here, and we thought that using Mentimeter might be a helpful way to kind of get a robust conversation virtually that you, um, or a more robust conversation than you can typically get virtually. So I know you guys, or most of you have used Mentimeter before because we used it for voting a few meetings ago, but for those of you who aren't familiar, um, it's probably easiest if you have your uh, smartphone um, to, to use that, but you can also kind of maneuver your windows on your computer so you can see both at one time. But go to www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and then you're going to input the code at the top, 752141, and I'll give you a second to do that. And we're just going to have a couple fun questions at the beginning just to um, remind you all how this works. Um, 
part, how Mentimeter works. So this is just an example of kind of the typing in questions. Um, so the question is, in what state or country did you grow up? Yep, getting answers. And then it's a word cloud. So the more more answers per, per answer, <laughs> the bigger the font will be. All right, a lot of Michigan, a lot of Colorado natives. Nice. Nice, that's a really good spread, fun. Somebody's got five states. All right, so that's what it looks like when you just type in. Uh, this is multiple choice question. I'm gonna hide the answers. So what is the latest snow ever recorded in Denver? Which is a very timely question to ask since it is, I think, almost 90 degrees right now. Just give you guys a second. All right, and the correct answer is June 12th, so we could still see snow technically. Um, so yeah, there was a trace of snow on June 12th in 1951. Fun fact. All right, so now you guys get the idea of both the typing in and the multiple choice type of questions for Mentimeter. So let's think back to what Jacob and Alvin were presenting about the project types and categories, and we have a couple questions related to that. So. The first one is a multiple choice. So are there any of these project types or categories, these were the ones that were in blue on that slide, that you do not think should be included in the RTP? And then select any of those that apply. We'll just wait for the results. And feel free at any time if you need a question clarified or anything, just raise your hand. Um, and then maybe Melinda or Emily, if you let me know that somebody's raised their hand, I'm happy to discuss. So seeing a lot of votes for regional transportation operations and technology, maybe being one that would not be included as well as freights and good, freight and goods movement. Hey Lisa, this is Melinda. Um, it looks like we do have a hand raise from Phil Greenwald. Um, are, are you able to take a question now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Phil, you should be able to speak. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering if the results can be um, can be put off until the very end of the, or till closer oh, to the end. Hidden? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know if I can do that. I would have to change a setting. Um, That's there's, okay. I mean, if you just don't look at the, right. Um, if you just don't look at the computer screen, you won't see the results. So if you just look at your phone or you just look at the Mentimeter screen, you won't see the results. Thank you. you yeah. All right. So it looks like 15 votes for regional transportation operations and technology, then freight, and then active transportation. Let's go to the next question. Are there any project types that you think should receive greater emphasis in the plan? And you can choose three of these. And all of these options were on the, the full gamut that was on that slide. So including those air quality, regional significant roadway capacity projects, rapid transit product projects, the four that we just talked about, and the other. All right, so looks like a lot for multimodal safety, then the, the rapid transit projects, roadway capacity projects, active transportation. Um, as we can expect from the previous question, fewer votes for the regional transportation operations and technology and freight and goods movement, but still several people that um, voted for those, and then 11 for other. All right, we'll move on to the next question. So this one is an open-ended question, so you're going to type it in the same way that you did whatever state you're from. Are there any project types missing that you think could better reflect the region's priorities? So thinking about the public engagement that we've done, thinking about your local community and what you hear most often, is there something that wasn't included in those in that group of project types or categories that you think should be? 
capacity expansion, transit operations, transit and shared mobility, urban freeway removal, maintaining existing infrastructure, first and last three to five miles, reducing parking, asset management, mobility, transit operations, another one, low income housing near transit, First and last mile, mobility, transit operations, transit, shared mobility, gulches, and I'm guessing that's trails, shared mobility. These are all great. That's lots of good, good ideas. Give it another second or two, see if any more come in. Oh. Regional transportation operations coordination, overall safety, not just multimodal safety or multi safety. All right, we'll move on. Thanks for doing that. And we will have a couple more questions throughout the presentation. Um, they'll just kind of be sprinkled in. So I'm going to pass this back to Jacob. Okay. And I guess before we go into the next session, I'd like to open it up for just kind of open-ended uh, questions or conversation on this piece of it before we move forward. Just a reminder to raise your hand uh, if you do have a comment or want to have further discussion. Thank you. And I guess maybe to prompt some conversation, here's a question I have based on these results. I'd be curious to hear from someone who'd be willing to volunteer that had the opinion about maybe not emphasizing so much the um, the transportation operations um, in the in the RTP as a project type category. Uh, Jacob, this is Melinda. It looks like we uh, we do have a few hands raised. Um, I'll go ahead and start with um, Art Griffith and make sure that he is unmuted. All right, Art, you should be able to speak. Yes, um, in all the scenarios, Jacob, will we have um, like work from home so that it's not in any one scenario, but as all the scenarios that you're going to move forward after this screening process, will all of them have a work at home element? Yeah, Art, I think the short answer is yes, in the sense that that is definitely going to be one of the tools in the toolbox as we put the uh, the fiscally constrained and the, and the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan together. I guess I just was thinking that that's in every option as a base. Yeah, I guess hard. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, we might be saying it two slightly different ways, but I think the question is, are we if we're carrying that strategy forward, is that going to be part of the final mix? Yes, it is. Jacob this, is, Jacob, this is Ron, if I might just add a little bit to that, because I think there's there's two things, two, two issues related to that are, one is sort of, you know, there is a regional uh, travel demand management program that's funded with regional funds that does things like promoting teleworking and carpooling and transit use. And so the extent to which we invest in those programs to promote those things um, is a decision within the context of the RTP to be addressed. The second piece is um, in terms of assuming, making assumptions or planning for changes in travel behavior over time that we need to account for in this planning process given sort of experience, recent experience with more people teleworking um, out of necessity because of the current uh, coronavirus situation. Um, how much of that will stick, if you might? Um, how much? How much will sort of we've we've been seeing for several years now growth in teleworking um, as a commute option? Um, but obviously, uh, there's a real question about 
with so many more people now telecommuting out of necessity after this current crisis is done, how much how much will that trajectory change over time, and how much should we um, consider those potential changes sort of in the background assumptions for putting the plan together? Art, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for the expansion, Ron. Are there any other hands raised? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, it looks like our next question will be from uh, Brian Weimer. Brian, you are self-muted, so you should be able to speak. All right, thank you. And this might be a little bit premature question, but as we're talking about inclusion of various things, as you know, um, you know, uh, as we get into funding projects, i.e. the TIF, um, capacity projects that have been specifically identified had to be included in the fiscally constrained um, plan. So if we're looking at providing other included in the plan and starting to um, identify those. Does that mean those type of projects would need to be included in the plan before you could fund them? Or does it go back to current where maybe a safety project could be funded um, because it's on a principal arterial? Um, same thing with operational improvements, I guess, uh, maintenance would be one of those. So I'm curious how you envision this information being used down the road. Yeah, so Brian, that's a good question. Let me start an answer and then maybe I'll uh, ask Ron to help. Um, so let me start with the premise that just to be clear, all of these things, everything we're talking about, everything on the slide, everything that we're talking about, those have always been and will continue to be part of a regional transportation plan. Um, so it's not like we're it's not like we're suggesting that we haven't addressed some of these topics before, and so you know we're going to address something for the first time. That's not the case. Really, the question is how do we how do we convey that information in the regional transportation plan? So, for example, things like sidewalks. Sidewalks are a really good example. They're very important, um, but we certainly don't list individual sidewalks in the regional transportation plan, and we're not proposing to. Right? We're too large of a region to do that. So, if someone came to us and said you know, show us in the plan where sidewalks are, we would point to the financial table that talks about, um, in the financial plan, the tables that, that talk about uh, revenues and expenditures dedicated to things like sidewalks or uh, local bus routes or maintenance projects or a whole list of other things, right? So those things are have always been there. They've continued to be there. Really what we're getting at here is, again, again this issue that, um, you know, we meet the federal requirements. We're going to continue to do that. Um, but we want to give a better sense to everyone, all of our stakeholders, all of the region of what are the investment priorities um, as conveyed in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. So we're suggesting that some of these topics, and safety is a good example. I think we already have some consensus here that safety is absolutely important. You know, can we elevate safety as one example where even if we're not showing, say, an individual safety project at an intersection, we have the high entry network. Uh, from the Regional Vision Zero Plan, we have critical corridors. We have tools at our disposal through our planning process and our partners planning processes that provide uh, provide more definition, provide more of a framework for how we think about safety and, and clues and sort of direction to the region about where we'd like to see, uh, for example, safety investments going forward. Um, so let me stop there and ask Ron to, to tag team on that. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. No, I, th I think that's absolutely right. I think just to add a little bit of um, um, nuance to that, I think, Brian, to your point, yes, decisions about projects to fund in the four-year transportation improvement program should be tied back to the regional priorities that have been expressed by us collectively in the long-range regional transportation plan. Um, so um, major capacity projects, can't be funded with discretionary regional transportation funds unless they are identified as a priority in the RTP. I think what we're trying to speak to here is beyond those capacity projects, 
there are a host of other sort of regionally important um, transportation investment priorities that we've uh, that we'd like to identify through this planning process so that as we are um, allocating or identifying the use of discretionary regional transportation funds that they're going to those projects that will um, move the needle in terms of helping us achieve the regional uh, goals and objectives that we've identified in MetroVision. Brian, does that answer your question? It is an answer. Um, I think there's more discussion to be had with that as we continue on with the presentation. Okay, Jacob, would you like me to move on to the next question? Yes. Okay. Uh, our next question will be from uh, Phil Greenwald. Uh, Phil, you're self-muted, so you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Thank you. Yeah, the Phil, this is Phil Greenwald from City of Longmont. Just wanted to, um, it kind of goes back to the last two questions from Art and Brian here a little bit, but it's it's really looking back at the idea, Jacob, of the public outreach that you guys did, and you guys did such a great job of it, and it looked very complete and uh, very helpful, but I'm afraid that in like with post-COVID uh, kind of environment here, we're going to be, I'm guessing a lot of those answers would change, right? And so um, one issue is just the idea that um, the public outreach, you know, they, they said a lot of things in there that were, um, you know, they kind of had safety and maintenance kind of toward the bottom. Um, and I'm wondering if safety wouldn't definitely, well, I think it would definitely move up. Um, and maintenance is one of those things that just isn't very sexy. So I'm guessing nobody would really ever pick general maintenance of the system. But I think we all know on in the, on the on the on the call here today that maintenance is fairly critical for for everything to continue to work. And so we need to put uh, resources there as well. So I'm just hoping, first of all, that as staff, you guys are looking at kind of the safety and maintenance issues that are out there and and you know. I hate to say regardless of what the public says, but in addition to what the public says, that um, staff will look at those issues and elevate them to the proper, the proper levels when you're doing this. And then also just kind of take into account what Art was saying about work at home and, and how things uh, have probably changed for all of us uh, for not just this year, but the next five probably for, for us, the way we kind of think about um, moving around and, and uh, transportation and, and the and the priorities. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Phil. I appreciate that. Um, just a couple of quick sort of responses to uh, some good issues that you raised there. When it comes to, so when we talk about sort of how we think about projects in the plan and how we, um, how we describe or show those projects or project type categories, to some extent, it's not an either or. So for example, you know, I think we're hearing today that safety is, is of absolute paramount. You know, it's not like we elevate safety at the expense of something else, right? If we decide collectively that safety and, you know, project type X, Y, and Z are all important, well, we can elevate them all in the plan. Um, so that's the good news. Part of the way in which we deal with this, so let's talk about maintenance, is, you know, part of the way we deal with this is how we, how we emphasize projects or project type categories in the plan, how we display them, how we show them, how we talk about them. That's half the discussion. The other part of the discussion is how we make those choices in the financial plan. So maintenance is an example of, of an investment where we're probably not going to have a list of like specific maintenance projects in the RTP, right? That's probably not the right approach for that. 
what is probably the right approach is if, you know, if there's sort of collective consensus that maintenance is a critical priority, that gets expressed in how we make those uh, financial plan allocations as we're building the financial plan. You know, how much of those uh, investment allocations do we, um, uh, do we dedicate to maintenance, you know, versus some other, um, other types of categories. So we're thinking about both of those as we move forward. Great, thank you. Linda, are there more questions on this um, on this topic? Um, I'm going to go ahead and put all hands down at this time, just in case uh, people who left their hand up maybe have another question. We'll give them everyone just a moment. Jacob, while they're doing that, I did have one uh, comment on the RTOT. Um, you had asked early on why we would not have said that be included in the plan and. I was one of those and the reason is is that we already have a set aside specific for that now if it's not just be a general that i would probably have a little different look at that but where if it was specific um calling out specific projects i think that's worthy of some discussion okay yeah, and I guess our thought um, going back to the memo is this one's a little bit tricky. I don't know that we envision necessarily coming up with a list of like, you know, 30 RT and RTOT projects, right? Um, but are there some big picture regional priorities, uh, which I think there are that are worth sort of calling out um, in the plan, you know, elevating that piece of the conversation to say, you know, look, in this arena, you know, here's here's three priority things or five priority things that um, you know, that, that are regional priorities and that, again, um, are worth, um, you know, are worth some investment priority allocations. So whether that's just a financial plan conversation or whether it's an, also a narrative uh, conversation in the RTP, I mean, I think, again, just like with Phil's question, you know, we're looking at both of those, uh, both of those methods in terms of how we think about and talk about um, and put resources to projects in the RTP, projects and project type categories. Thank you. Melinda, were there any other hands raised? Uh, yeah, actually, yes, there is one that was raised. Uh, it's from Paul DeSatis. Paul, I'm going to unmute you now, and you should be able to speak. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. The, uh, a couple of those questions got me thinking about a few concerns that CDOT um, has with um, the the uh, agenda packet and, um, you know, specifically, um, you know, the discussion was brought up surrounding maintenance. And I think it's interesting to point out that uh, Region 1 has been working with our staff bridge people. And we've identified a need for um, replacement of substandard bridges in Region 1 totaling $395 million. So our maintenance, our asset management costs um, continue to rise through the roof. And, um, you know, some of those bridges, uh, you know, like the one that, um, and I'm sorry, I was late to the meeting. We talked about the uh, TIP amendment today, um, but I-76 York, we've been out to that, uh, we've been out to that bridge three times in one month to replace holes as big as six feet by 12 feet. So the way CDOT manages our maintenance funding is, um, is pretty important to us to have that flexibility. And so um, another comment that I have related to uh, the agenda packet is, you know, we've reviewed the materials that were provided and um, we're left with a number of questions surrounding what appears to be a new proposed change in decision making um, for how the uh, regional transportation funds and the project selection would occur for both state and federal dollars to meet the Dr. Cog goals. And um, you know, I don't know if anybody can um, answer that question right now, but we're just trying to understand how these um, changes will be specific to CDOT um, so that we can maintain that flexibility to do things like maintenance, um, critical maintenance improvements when we need to do those. Obviously, when a bridge is um, going to collapse, um, you know, we can't get let it get to that point. So, um, so we're just a, a little concerned that we haven't had the opportunity to engage in um, focused, collaborative conversations surrounding the major changes that are being proposed right now, and how those could actually affect CDOT's Transportation Commission planning goals as well. And so, um, until we have that in additional information, and I understand this is an informational session now, um, we uh, we can't agree to those changes at this point. 
Um, so anyway, um, curious what you all think about that. Thank you. John, would you like to respond or would you like me to? Uh, I'm fine. Paul, thanks. I appreciate appreciate that. Um, I first of all um, appreciate your input and your thoughts. Um, second of all, it's not exactly a change, and by that I mean that um, the metropolitan planning uh, transportation planning process for the region is a cooperative, collaborative process, um, and that means that we make decisions together, jointly and cooperatively, um, under our um, federal regional transportation planning um, laws and rules. There's obviously um, as an asset owner, a significant role that CDOT plays in determining the asset management, the maintenance activities, and the amount of resources that get dedicated to those, to those needs. Uh, same for RTD. Uh, we're not trying to dictate what your day-to-day -day maintenance um, priorities should be. But there is a there's a discussion about sort of of all the available transportation resources to be spent on um, the regional system within the MPO area, um, there's a joint process to work through to identify the available resources and the uses of those resources, regardless of who the owner of the facility is. And mainly what this process that we're talking about today is focused on sort of the discretionary uh, resources that go to expanding and improving the transportation system, not the basic um, asset management and maintenance um, actions uh, of, the, of the jurisdictions uh, or the agencies like CDOT. This is really about uh, what our collective regional objectives are and our goals are and how we best meet those through the strategic investments that are identified in the regional transportation plan. I think that that's not particularly different than past RTP cycles where, you know, CDOT identifies its priorities uh, for its system and we evaluate those priorities in the context of the region's um, priorities and MetroVision um, together and we make joint decisions about what the best set of investments are to prioritize in the regional transportation plan. Hey, uh, Ron, this is Paul just responding back to you, and thank you for your comments there. Um, the Probably the biggest concern that CDOT has is just that um, when we think about capital projects, our capital projects tend to be the legislatively directed funding that go through our Transportation Commission. So Senate Bill 267, Senate Bill 1, you know, um, these aren't um, funding sources that often, you know, you couldn't you, you couldn't consider them um, a continuous funding stream. It happens when the legislature feels like giving us some money, and they've done that over the last few years, which is great. Um, but when we get those big funding sources, uh, as you know, we go through a huge planning process like we did this summer, and then we work with our Transportation Commission, and they are the only ones who can actually direct how funding like that is, uh, is uh, directed. So um, I, I just hope you can um, keep that in mind as we go forward. Yeah, I certainly do, Paul. And I look forward to a further conversation. I just I do want to point out, though, that within a within a metropolitan planning organization boundary, within within an urb, a large urbanized area, there are specific federal laws and rules that drive how we do regional transportation planning. And the whole point of this discussion and developing a regional transportation plan for the metropolitan area is to identify those priorities together so that when funding does become available for projects we have that list of projects already prioritized and identified to allocate those funds to okay thank you ron and uh you know cdot is looking forward to uh to sitting down with you guys and talking through this a little bit more thank you Okay, well, Linda, are there any other hands raised for this section? Uh, yes, a new hand just popped up. It looks like it's from Art Griffith. So Art, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. 
Well, thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, when we look at um, a lot of these past comments, you know, about uh, system preservation, and uh, I think that we have to be careful in in any tip cycle cycle that's coming up or new funding that could come down the pike stream to allow um, the various agencies, including the Dr. Cog board, to recognize those deficiencies, as Paul Jositis brought up, related to the bridges and things, so that um, so that that would be reflected, you know, and encouraged um, in those actual implementation of funding. So I kind of like I'm thinking of this as it's it's two pots of money. One is more visionary 2050 plan, but in any one uh, programmed money slate that Dr. Cog does, you know, um, just as CDOT would do with their a 10 year pipeline, you're always adjusting that pipeline to meet the immediate needs. And I think um, the Dr. Cog board needs to consider that because, you know, you can't just get by without part of an interstate closed because of a bridge um, replacement or something. So I don't know how those two link, but um, I think we need to make sure that we have some language in the 2050 Metro Vision that links that to implementing um, based on uh, known priorities within certain tip cycles. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Art. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Melinda, any other hands raised? At this time, there are no other hands raised. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, why don't we go on to the next section? That would be great. Okay. Um, so, I think we've actually already started talking about it, but let's now more formally talk about uh, project identification and solicitation. Next slide. Okay. Um, so. Again, and, and let's put a little bit of context here, given the conversation that we just had, um, in the sense that the Regional Transportation Plan is a combination of many things. Um, it's a combination of specific projects that we do need to identify, as we've talked about our federal requirements uh, for regionally significant capacity projects, and it's everything else that kind of goes into our multimodal regional transportation system that's in, encapsulated in the RTP, either through specific projects, project types, or in the financial plan. So for this part of the conversation, what we're really talking about here is projects that we think that we would individually list and map and identify in the plan. So specific projects that, you know, that we would show in the plan this way. So this is not a financial plan allocation conversation. And I want to be very clear about that. Uh, what this is, is a conversation about how do we identify those big picture projects at a minimum, the regionally significant roadway capacity and rapid transit capacity projects. Um, maybe more um, that, that we agree that we're going to show and list in the plan and that we need to individually identify. So having said that background, uh, we have a couple of proposals here about, uh, about how to step into this. Um, first of all, just like the recent TIP process, we are proposing to use the county transportation uh, forums as a mechanism for um, identifying and for folks to submit projects um, to us as part of you know, candidate project evaluation. Um, the reasons for that, I think, are somewhat obvious, but just to be clear, you know, there you all have put a lot of work into standing up those forms, uh, making those forms work. You just went through it for the TIP process. Um, we think that's a great um, sort of opportunity for collaboration, uh, working together at the sort of county level, county geography, um, to identify needs and priorities and work together to submit candidate projects uh, for us to um, to submit. What we've done in the past is actually done this sort of solicitation from individual jurisdictions. And while I think there's nothing wrong with that, um, I think the TIP process has shown how valuable it is uh, to be a little bit more collaborative in how we work together. So bottom line is that we are proposing to use the forums as a mechanism um, to identify uh, and solicit candidate projects. The other piece that's shown on this slide is um, some proposals about how many projects the forums would submit. Um, and we're happy to have this conversation about what is the right number of projects. What I will say before we get into that is a couple things. Um, one is that what we sort of proposed here as staff, I think I've counted up if my math's right, it's about 100 or 110 projects that, that could potentially be 
um, be submitted. And, you know, that's a big number, but that's okay. We can do that. Um, part of the way in which we think we can do that, though, and we'll get to this in a couple slides, is that we are proposing, again, like the TIP, uh, to do a qualitative evaluation. Uh, we think that's most appropriate for a 30-year plan. We'll get to that issue in a, in a slide or two. Uh, but part of the thinking here is that we want to, we're putting, we're putting more emphasis, we think, on the front end of, um, depending on well, at the forum level, at the local level, to identify needs and priorities and feel like you have the opportunity to submit projects to evaluate. Um, and then uh, we're trying to streamline that work on the back end um, in terms of doing that as a qualitative evaluation. So in other words, if we, we could have fewer projects that we maybe evaluate more quantitatively or we can have more projects that we evaluate more qualitatively, but we do have some schedule constraints um, that can't change in terms of the work that we need to get through this summer and fall. Um, and so we're trying to come up with sort of the best process to balance um, input um, and, and response to that input. Uh, so with that, I think let's go to the next slide. Alvin? So a key part of our thinking has also been taking into account the projects that are already in our current 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, we've broken those into three general categories. Uh, the first ones are those that don't even need to be included because they're going to be done by the end of this year. So just by definition, they don't need to be in our new planning period uh, funded. The second category are those that will be automatically included. So for projects that are currently under construction, but they're not going to be done by the end of this year, they're not going to be open to traffic by the end of this year, or projects that are currently going through uh, a NEPA phase or have just completed a NEPA phase, those will be automatically included. And then there are projects that are in our tip right now that have construction or NEPA funding. Those would also be automatically included. That last category is, are those projects that could compete in our solicitation, whatever that ultimately ends up looking like. So those are projects that are planning for some pre-NEPA studies. Those could be your planning and environmental linkage studies or your corridor plans. Other 2040 projects that aren't captured by these four previous descriptions. And then there's some local, locally funded projects in our RTP. If you uh, think that they need to be uh, applied for, for federal funding, those could compete in the solicitation as well. So those, these are the general breakdown of all the projects in our current 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and what would occur to each of those depending on where they are in the process. Next slide. All right, so we're going to go to back to Mentimeter. And well, as you could see from the previous questions, it the um, Mentimeter really helped to spur a conversation. So let's just do this multiple choice question and then we can open it up to discussion uh, if you guys want to talk more about this. So the question is, do you support using the county transportation forums to solicit candidate projects? Yes, no, or unsure? All right, so seeing about two thirds saying yes, but a good number of people are staying unsure. So I think let's open this up to discussion so we can talk a bit more about that. And then we've got a couple of people saying no as well. So um, yeah, let's, let's hear more about why you chose whatever answer you chose. You wanna raise your hand and Melinda, if you wanna let us know who, who can speak. Absolutely. Um, it looks like our first uh, comment or question is from Eileen Yazzi. So Eileen, I will unmute you and you should be able to speak. Sure. Um, this is Eileen Yazzi from Denver. I think one of the questions um, is I actually I have I have a question before this question I feel like should have been proposed is the past I two or three meetings, we've been talking about this data-driven process. We've been running scenarios, getting a lot of really great information about results of scenarios. And then, and then I feel like that we, we, we've dropped that data-driven process and we're now moving to solicit projects for 25th for the RTP. I feel like there's a, quite a big disconnect of and don't get me wrong, I'm more than happy to solicit projects, but I feel like there's a pretty big disconnect between all this data-driven 
and a technical analysis we've done on the transportation modeling effort. And then it's not being integrated into this and we're just being asked to solicit projects. So I actually feel like there's a pretty big missing link between those two efforts. Can someone help me link those up or help me understand how they do connect and then how a solicitation from local agencies, even though they're at the forums, would actually respond to meeting the needs of those scenarios that we spent so much time testing? Yeah, so Elena, this is Jacob. Thanks for your thanks for your question. That's a good um, that's a good question, a good comment. So let me try to address it. Um, I'd say in a nutshell, the bottom line is that uh, we're proposing to sort of bridge that gap or connect those two in two ways. One is the conversation that we've just been having, which is about you know what are these sort of key project types or project categories that we feel are worthy of of emphasizing in the RTP. Um, and so I think that's you know when we think about safety, when we think about transit. Um, think about, you know, several of those things from the scenario results. That's one way in which, you know, we're trying to carry those forward. Again, the project types are all about reflecting investment priorities, ultimately uh, regional priorities in the regional transportation plan. So I think that's one way. The other way, which we haven't discussed just yet, but we will get to in a couple slides, is the beginnings of a conversation about how we evaluate uh, these candidate projects. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to preclude that conversation or, or pre- you know, get there ahead of time, but um, that's the other way in which we want to carry forward some of those thoughts and some of those ideas uh, from the scenario work into uh, this sort of project phase going forward. Does that help a little bit? It does. I still think that there's a gap, um, and um, and I do appreciate all of that information. I do appreciate the um, knowledge that all of these transportation forums have. I think, though, they I, I actually still feel like we're missing a data-driven process. Um, while I understand we'll just use safety, if that's a priority, shouldn't Dr. Cog be saying, these are our highest problems. How are we going to solve them? Versus giving it out to the forums and saying, I hope everyone understands what safety means, and I think we all do, and please tell us your solutions or your, your proposed projects that could solve those problems in your area. That's where I feel like there's a gap from a local standpoint to a regional standpoint. Yeah, and I, I, I lean this, sorry. Yeah. Go no, ahead, finish. Going. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Eileen. I, I appreciate that because it's, it's something that we've thought about a lot and tried to figure out. And I think just to reemphasize a, a couple of Jacob's points, one is one way to make that connection is to propose sort of these new project categories that go beyond sort of just the minimally requ federally required sort of category of just regional air quality um, significant projects, right? Basically capacity projects and really try to express through this plan what our real regional priorities are that, that we believe collectively will help us achieve sort of regional transportation outcomes uh, that we have said we want to achieve through MetroVision, uh, where and where we're quite frankly right now off target or you know not achieving those targets or where we say we want to be. So soliciting projects sort of around those categories that I think were informed by the scenario uh, work and the results that we saw from the scenarios to help shape those project categories to provide that sort of feedback to the forums and make that connection between sort of county level priorities not just individual jurisdiction priorities but county level priorities within the context of those and i, I will say that you know the scenario work was really important and um, i'm really glad that we did that the intent of the scenario work was never to choose a scenario. It was to help us all understand collectively sort of what the dynamics are between sort of broad stroke choices, uh, big choices and sort of transportation outcomes. And I think we, we gained what we needed to gain out of that process. And at some point we need to start to, we need to take the next step and identify sort of a range of project opportunities to invest in, realizing that we will never have enough money 
over the plan period to invest in everything and all of those projects and making sure that we have a framework that can help us make choices from this point forward and when we get those project ideas from all of our partners in terms of what we actually invest in in the plan. Thanks for your answer. I still personally feel that, and I, I again, I appreciate everything you said, but I, I and I understand the, the lessons learned of the scenarios that we ran, but I think I'm a little concerned, for instance, that if, it, if we're, I, I just don't know how a, a, a group of projects are going to in the, that that are that are solicited independently at these forums will piece together for a regional solution to meet a lot of our goals. I don't know how that would address us say we'll pick on we'll keep going on safety, how independently we would get to vision zero at this region if we allow that to happen at a localized forum. And I think that goes back with, if you look at data from a regional perspective, so say that, and I'll, I, I don't know if this is correct, I'm kind of making, you know, federal and Colfax, are, those are two Denver hotspots. We know that those are hotspots for Denver. Is that, are those the two corridors from a regional perspective where we need to, where, where the region needs to invest to get our, our, um, our deaths down to zero? Is it certain quarter? I, so that's where I feel like there's a still a disconnect from the data perspective at a regional level on how to solve and meet our regional goals down to the forum. But um, I'll let you continue. Yeah, I no, I, I can I, so Eileen, what, what, what alternative approach would you suggest? Um, I think maybe what you mentioned earlier about a framework, I think that would, again, all of the planning efforts that you've done, even on the freight side, I mean, Collectively, you know, I I would think that enough of the studies have shown where the problems are at regionally. So I would think then that there would be projects or corridors or spots or related to issues would then turn to solutions out of those regional efforts. Yeah. So I guess so. Are you are you, is is that a vote for Dr. Cog staff proposing the list of projects that we collectively invest in over the next 30 years in the RTP? I don't know if that's what I think that goes back with the word framework. If there was some additional framework um, and kind of again that almost that data framework to say this is what we're seeing and this is you know kind of that 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 framework of data when it comes to those types of project categories about safety about transit, about multimodal solutions, I think that would help kind of get that those forums on the same playing field. Does that make sense from a data standpoint? And then not necessarily, so again, it's, and I think going back to the goals of the, of the 50 year, of the 2050 plan, so if, say, if it's to get to vision zero, zero deaths, what are, what are the investments, the proposed investments or either the problem areas and the quarters that need to be invested in to, to get to zero. I'll just keep using that as the example. Yep. So that's that's what I kind of feel that we're missing is that, that data framework of those categories to say, these are our problems. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, Eileen, and I don't want to keep, uh, we've got a lot to get through, but I, I, I think this is a really important conversation. And I hope that you see that kind of the, the framework that we're trying to, to get through today and, and propose here is trying to do just that. It is trying to tie together a lot of the sort of planning work that's been done up to this point, the regional freight plan, taking action on regional vision zero. Um, there's been a regional BRT study that that um, RTD has, has completed, uh, focused on sort of on transit. There's a regional active transportation uh, plan all of those things sort of play a role 
and provide important um, information and data to help shape those investments. Now, we're, you can't, you can't, and we, we will never have enough money in the plan to be able to invest in every single one of those needs that's identified in every one of those plans. So within that framework, we ask our planning partners to identify priorities in their areas within this framework. And then as Jacob will get to a little bit later, there's a, there's a proposed process to help evaluate all of those different needs against the regional priorities in that framework to make a decision about to invest in this, but not in this, to invest in that, but not in this other thing. Okay. Let's see if we can get that. Linda, do we have other hands raised? I know Tim Kirby has wanted to, to comment. Yes, and uh, thank you for pointing that out. I'm so sorry, Tim. Um, I will go ahead and unmute you, and if you still wanted to ask a question or speak, you are able to. Yeah, hey guys, can you all hear me all right? Ron, Jacob, am I coming through? Yes. Yep. All right, very good. So I do have a number of questions and I hate to take the conversation backwards. Uh, appreciate the apologies. I haven't had my hand raised for quite some time. I want to go back to the points that that uh, Paul raised and we do want to follow with Dr. Cog offline, but um, there are a couple of things that I'm hoping you guys can help me with um, from the Dr. Cog perspective so I can understand kind of this situation entirely. So Jacob, Ron, hoping you can answer this question for me. So it's my understanding that historically the Dr. Cog fiscally constrained RTP, and I'm talking about, you know, for, for non-locally funded projects have, have been situated into two categories. And again, this is historic, not based on what you're proposing. Um, it's been Dr. Cog controlled and CDOT controlled. Do I have that correct? Sort of, not exactly. Okay, can you help me clarify that please? So, in previous iterations of the RTP before 2040, we had an established process where when we got to this point of sort of identifying and evaluating, you know, sort of these candidate projects, these projects that we would individually list in the plan, um, we did CDOT and Dr. Cog projects together. It was, it was a joint process. We, we put them all in that bucket and we scored them together. It's only been actually in the last version of the plan, the 2040 plan, where somehow we got off track and CDOT projects were given to us separately. That has not actually been the historical practice. Okay, but the most recent practice was two separate categories. So, is that correct, Jacob? That's how it is in the 2040 plan. But that's not how it's been historically. Not historically, but in the last, but in the last version, there were kind of these two defined paths. Do I have that correctly? Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So, um, so. It's not fair. It's not fair to say historically it's gone that way, but in the last plan it went that way. And if I'm understanding you correctly, Jacob, you're saying, or not Jacob, Dr. Cog is saying, um, let's bring, you know, let's move away from what we did as part of the last plan, move more towards our historical perspective, and do everything from kind of a combined call. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair to say, Tim, in the sense that. You know, as Ron has alluded to earlier, we have, you know, federal requirements that you're aware of of our 3C planning process where we work together collaboratively, our three agencies and all the stakeholders on this call, and we make decisions together. Um, and we are not, it, it, it's not following that process to sort of divide up colors of money and to say, you know, here's a decision process for one set of colors of money and here's a, a separate, um, not collaborative decision making process for a different set of colors of money. So Jacob, do me a favor because I've heard that term, you know, collaboration and co and cooperation thrown around quite a bit. Can you define that for me, based on Dr. Cog's perspective? Yeah, based on our perspective, um, we are, as we've highlighted in this conversation, you know, we think that there's a set of regional priorities out there in the plans that our agency, your agency, and other agencies have done. Uh, things like safety, things like transit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we want to reflect those regional priorities in the 2050 and BRTP. We want to work together in terms of decision making of how do we how do we best allocate our collective scarce financial resources to best achieve outcomes around those priorities. 
So question for, for Ron and Jacob, is the implication that we're currently not working together collaboratively and cooperatively, CDOT and Dr. Cog, that is? Tim, I, 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 please don't take it that way. That's not the way this whole discussion is intended. But there's a difference between an agency saying, we have this money available to invest in our transportation system. Here is our list of priorities for our money. Put this list of priorities in the regional plan. Compared to, here's collectively the available resources to invest in transportation priorities around the region, recognizing that some of those funds have very specific purposes. Some of those funds have very specific restrictions on their use. Um, some facilities, uh, different facilities are owned and operated by different agencies. But we have a federally designated regional urban transportation process here um, that is led by Dr. Cog, but not entirely owned by Dr. Cog. We are the designated metropolitan planning organization but our planning process is designed to be collaborative and cooperative between our member local jurisdictions, between CDOT, Dr. Cog, and RTD. And that is how decision-making should be done. And under federal law, the regional transportation plan is meant to capture all of the priorities for the region that help us meet regional and federal planning guidelines. So that's the process we're talking about, Tim. Yeah, and Ron, I appreciate the patience as I work through this because what I'm trying to wrap my head around and, and do, doing it in a collaborative, collaborative and cooperative fashion is, you know, just what we've done in the past versus what's what's being discussed now, just so I have, you know, 100% clarity on, on how we're moving forward. Because let me tell you how I understood it, Ron, and, and Jacob, and you guys tell me how how I'm wrong, is what I've understood in the past is what we've done is we've compared the needs of CDOT with the needs of Dr. Cog and we've come together jointly. We have a venue for that, our, four, our 4P our four process, and then we have conversations. And so, you know, I'm just trying to understand, have we deviated from that? Is is that kind of, and I know that's a historic process because that goes back to the, to the late 1990s. Um, is, is that not meeting the definition of collaborative and cooperative from the perspective of Dr. Cog? And let me, and, and while you contemplate that, let me ask you another question. Um, because I did read the packet materials very closely, um, and, and I've also seen it in your presentation. We've arrived at certain um, application limits um, for, for member jurisdictions, CDOT being one of those, CDOT limited to 15. And I'm curious, is that number arbitrary? Was there a methodology associated with that? And if there was a methodology, if you could please share that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, so Tim, let me, let me start responding to that. So first of all, um, I know this is a, a hard conversation to have, and there's a point that I want to make here, which is that it's hard to talk about projects without dollars, and we get that, right? When, whenever any of us talk about projects, we want to talk about money, and how do those two things work together? What I'm going to ask you to do, and what I'm going to ask everyone to do today, we will have a little section on revenues at the end of this presentation, but for the purposes of what we're talking about here of, of project type categories, and right now when we're talking about project identification and solicitation, we're really focusing on the best projects. We want to we want to come up with this process in which we identify the best projects. And when I say projects, I mean again the you know the projects that we're going to list in the plan. I don't mean every single thing that goes into the RTP. You know, as we've already discussed in this conversation, some of those things like local sidewalks or other things are things that wouldn't rise to the level of projects that we identify. So I'm talking about the big projects that we identify. We're trying to get to a process here today about the best way to identify the best projects. This is not today a financial allocation conversation. This is not to say, well, if you identify this project, that means X dollars or Y dollars or this color of dollars or who owns those dollars or whatever. I realize it's hard to sort of divorce those links because we naturally think of them, um, but we're right now focusing on how do we identify those best regional projects, number one. Number two is that um, going to the 4P process, you know, nothing wrong with that process. We, we collaborate with you. We appreciate that. That's a great process. That process tends to be more of a near-term process. You do it every four years. Um, by a quirk in your scheduling, you kind of did it twice in two years, but it tends to be a near-term kind of process. We're talking about how do we do this for a 30-year transportation plan, and I think that's a little bit different. Yeah, no, well, I mean, 
and, and again, I think there's there's a detailed conversation to be taken offline, Jacob. And I and, and I think I have some follow up questions to that. I think you know at the core of my questioning is what I'm trying to understand when I hear Dr. Cog say a more collaborative and cooperative process. You know, again, is the implication that we do not have that today under the last process that was followed? And if we don't, help me understand why that's not the case. Tim, this is Ron. I, I, I wasn't around at Dr. Cog when the 2040 plan was put together. Um, but my understanding is that that process sort of uh, for a variety of reasons, um, largely ended up uh, being a process where CDOT presented um, sort of its list of projects that needed to be in the RTP with sort of CDOT money and said, here's our list, put it, and effectively put them in, and they were put in the plan, right? What we're suggesting is that's not true to the urban transportation planning process that is required of us and is appropriate for the region in terms of helping us address our multiple transportation needs and the objectives that we're trying to achieve collectively. And that there is a need, and I'm not suggesting that CDOT's priorities are not an important consideration. What I'm suggesting is that it needs to be within the context of our overall goals for the region's transportation system, including CDOT's transportation system, and that our structure, including voting members on the Regional Transportation Committee from CDOT, so that you have not just a voice, but votes in terms of making regional transportation decisions is how we exercise that cooperative transportation planning process. Yeah, that's that's helpful, Ron. Thanks for that. It sounds, if I'm hearing you correctly, you don't want to be handed a list of projects and say and and have CDOT saying, "Here's what you're going to go do." Whether or not that happened in the past, you know, I'd have to I'd yield to to my colleagues at CDOT, Paul Josidis, Jordan, and and and, and Danny Herman um, to to answer that question. Um, but I do want to be clear because I did have a I did have a specific question, and and maybe Jacob, I missed it in your answer, but it pertained directly to. Um, this limit of CDOT, of limiting CDOT's application to 15 projects. And if you could just help me answer that question directly, you know, how was that number arrived at and what was the underlying methodology? Yeah, sorry, Tim, I did mean to address that. So thanks for, um, I forgot to do that. So thanks for pointing that out. So, and again, we're happy to have a conversation, not just the forums, but CDOT RTD, what's the right number of projects? Um, again, here's the overall thinking. It's not so much that 15 or 10 for the forums or whatever is a magic number. It, here's the thought process. Um, as I said before, if you do the math, um, if my math's correct, that's somewhere between 100 and 110 projects just from what we're proposing that we might receive if everyone submitted sort of the maximum number of projects that we're proposing. And in order to, you know, given our scheduling and given where we need to be in about three to four months, in order to do that, um, as we're going to get to in a couple slides, we're proposing to use a um, a qualitative uh, evaluation process. So yeah, we can deal with 110 projects. Um, I think the question is what, you know, what is the right number? Um, again, I understand, I think where you're coming from, Tim, from CDOT's perspective, why are we limited to 15 projects? I wanna be clear, it's not that CDOT's limited to 15 projects in terms of what ends up in, uh, in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. What we're asking for, what we're thinking about here is again, those best sort of regional projects. There's a whole host of other investments that will work their way through the financial plan or through other ways into, into the regional transportation plan. Again, we're trying to be, we're trying to be uh, funding agnostic at the moment. We're just trying to think about how do we collectively together identify the best projects. So if we think that there's a good role for the forums, uh, we know that CDOT needs to have a voice, RTD needs to have a voice. If we put that together, we're already at 110 projects. Is that the right number? Should it be 100? Should it be 50? Should it be 200? I don't know. Um, but we need to, that's what this part of the conversation is also about, is how do we, how do we land on what's a manageable number, a reasonable number of projects that we want to evaluate? All right, very good. Thank you both, Ron and Jacob. I appreciate I did, it was not my intention to monopolize the, this portion of the conversation. Did have a number of questions. I think we still have a number of lingering questions and we would very much look forward um, to speaking both to you, Jacob and Ron, moving forward um, a, a, as we take a look at this. Um, so, so appreciate the time and thanks for the candid answers. Yep, thank you, Tim. This is part of the conversation we need to have, so thank you.
Melinda, are there other hands raised? Uh, yes, thank you, Jacob. Uh, it looks like our next question is from Art Griffith. So Art, you can go ahead and speak now. Um, wanting to go down that prairie dog hole just for a second and add one statement that a number of the local agency projects are on CDOT facilities. So, you know, that 15 number is just related to CDOT submitting projects, but a number of agencies um, submitted projects that are actually on um, CDOT's facility, including all of ours, just about from Douglas County, because we recognize that big benefit and need um, be integrated with their system. Thank you. Yeah, that's right, Art. And, and again, I know it's hard to do, but right now we're trying to be agnostic about who owns the facility, who manages the facility, who would be the project sponsor. You know, even in our 2040 plan, we have at least one, if not more, transit projects that were initially submitted by uh, by local government. We're trying to be agnostic about some of that right now and just kind of think about what are the best projects and, you know, regional projects. Melinda, are there other hands raised? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do have uh, an additional one. Um, it looks like Eileen would like to come back on. Eileen, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Sure. Um, quick question, um, and this is kind of to what uh, Tim was saying that I don't, I don't want to monopolize this, this presentation as well. Are we coming back to this again, or is this the only time for the tax discussion on this topic? We'll come back next month for further discussion. So Eileen, we wanted to, and everyone, we wanted to see where this conversation went today. Again, this is not an action item. Uh, we were hoping to get some consensus that we could carry forward to um, our regional transportation committee to the board in June. Uh, we'll see if we get there by the end of by the end of this agenda item. I think we're dealing with a couple of things here. You know, we absolutely want everyone to have as much input as we need to have in order to be able to collectively hopefully achieve some consensus and move forward on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, we do have some schedule constraints. If we're not, if we're not identifying and evaluating projects until like September or something, we're not going to get this plan done on time. Um, we need to find a way to navigate through this and, and keep moving the planning process forward. Um, I wish we had more time, I wish we had more time for scenarios and other things that we're attempting to do, but we do have to balance the work with the schedule. Um, Can you go over so what, what are what are the items that you're looking for today from the TAP for consensus? I'm sorry, say again, Eileen? You just mentioned that you're planning, to, you will be taking this forward to the board in June. So this is our time to talk about it at a regional level, you know, at, at, at this forum. So what are the items you are looking, even though it's not for action, you're looking for consensus out of this group, what are those items? So, and again, to be clear, that's kind of what we came in hoping for. We're not trying to dictate, let's see how the conversation goes. Um, but what we're looking for is consensus on, in part, the major project types and project categories, because that's really used in sort of the rest of this. What we're really looking for is, can we get to consensus on how we identify and solicit um, candidate projects? That's the bottom line, because if we can get consensus on that, we can start uh, once we get to the, if we go to the board in June, um, and get their, you know, their head nod or their approval, um, then we can start implementing that process. So even though this is not for action, I mean, you're you're essentially using this. I understand. I, I won't go down that path. Um, going back to what this idea of limiting numbers of for project solicitation for forums, I I will say this. I I have concerns. This goes back, and I'll keep harping on this about having a data-driven process. Um, for instance, and we'll just keep using safety just for this example, and even with transit investments, even with kind of major multimodal improvements or whatever else we're looking at, I would think again, there would be out of the plans while, it, and I understand there's not enough money to do everything. Totally get that. I think everybody on this call understands that. But what are the biggest regional projects that will move the needle to meet our goals? And on that, I would think that, you know, with, with Denver, how are we equal to having 10 applications for another sub-region with the amount of people we have moving on our transportation network 
every single day. I don't understand. And I think that goes back to CDOT's point, even with RTD, and then even from a regional perspective, I understand how, you know, oh, well, CDOT owns this roadway and, and we're, we're maintaining it or, or they're maintaining it, but it's in our county or it's in our city. I, I just don't, I, I am, I'm concerned that setting those limits based on just a, but based on an application standpoint and the amount of time to review and prioritize projects. And I definitely recognize how much time that takes, but I just don't know if setting that number equally at sub forums will, will get the region to meet its goals. Yeah, thank, thanks Eileen, this is Ron. We'll, we'll, do you have a, there's a balance here, right? Where we threw something out here, recognizing that um, we will never be able, we'll never make any decisions regionally on the projects if um, every county forum submits as many projects as they want to submit. So you got to kind of draw the line somewhere. Um, you know, this was our first cut. If you have an alternative way to do that, would love to hear that. Uh, we will absolutely bring um, this back to TAC, all of this back to TAC for a final look before we take it to the board, whether that's in a, a special work session that we try to schedule um, or at the next TAC meeting, we'll have some, we'll have some conversations about the best way to do that. Um, but I, I hear your points and I, I, I'd be interested in um, sort of any thoughts you have in terms of specifically how to change this um, would be very helpful to us um, rather than just general con statements of concern. Sure. And uh, definitely support any type of working group um, needed. Thank you so much. You bet. Melinda, are there any other hands raised? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it looks like we do have a few extra that have popped up. Um, our next one would be from Brian Weimer. So, Brian, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, make your comment. All right, thank you. Um, as all this discussion was going on, you know, I kind of looked at, if we're looking at this over a 30-year period, and actually I think you're asking for 115 projects, that's really less than four projects per year that you're kind of looking at. And so the question really arises, is that an adequate number to reflect in a 30-year transportation plan or consider in a 30-year transportation plan? And I think that's you know, what a lot of these discussions are, are starting to center around. And the you know, fact that maybe we're behind schedule is, I don't know, necessarily one of the things that should be considered in trying to bring us back into schedule is what is the way, you know, because this is a plan that's going to be out there for a while. You know, how do we best um, really start allocating uh, that fiscal constraint? And that's really where this is starting to center around. I know we're not supposed to think about the dollars, but ultimately it will end up with those dollars. In, and is that the best way of moving the needle uh, with a limited number of projects? And is there other ways of doing that? Maybe taking the priorities of other plans that have been done and were the biggest bang for the buck and uh, a lot of that evaluation that has currently been done. So that's that's my perspective, at least at this point. Okay, thank you, Brian. Moving to the next, next person. Sure. Uh, our next question will be from David Kretzinger. Dave, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Thanks, David Kretzinger, CDOT Division of Transit and Rail. Um, the conversation's been very helpful to me. I'm, I'm thinking about um, mostly transit, as you'd guess from my, from my background. Um, <clears throat> transit projects, I think, tend to be most successful um, as they cross many jurisdictions. They, um, local services, of course, important, but I think when we're talking about something like the Metro Vision 2050 plan, um, they cross many jurisdictions. So I think in the past, the 4P process has looked more like, you know, multiple jurisdictions would say, this quarter is important to me. And you sort of look at the patterns of everything. You say, aha, okay, that tells me we need to do a, you know, enhanced transit corridor or a BRT corridor or a rail line um, in, this, in this quarter. Um, 
from my perspective, I'm also looking at things that are going beyond the Dr. Cog boundaries because I see some of the challenges with air quality and congestion being um, those areas that are sort of right on the edge of two MPOs, both north and south, um, where I think growth is going to be the largest and it's going to affect um, multiple MPOs. So we're, we're looking out for things like busting. Final sort of piece of this, it might be that Dr. Cog needs to consider um, sort of an unlimited number of projects being submitted by each of the groups meeting some sort of criteria, not just not just a grab bag wish list, but um, not, not constrained to a list, and then have each entity that submits projects prioritize their projects so you can see um, prioritized rankings within each organization. Thank you. Thank you, David. Are there, is there another hand raised, Melinda? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next one will be from uh, Paul Desaitis. Paul, you can go ahead and speak. Yeah, sorry for the uh, large number of CDOT people talking. Um, I just wanted to kind of close out my comments with, uh, you know, I was not the RTD for the 2040 plan. It was about the time that the Region 1 and Region 6 merged. I have been at CDOT 22 years, though, um, and I was part of that process. And I will tell you, um, it was a collaborative process. And I think, I think it's important for everybody to know that everything CDOT does with respect to planning starts with our 4P program. And so we did that 4P two years ago, um, developed a really good list of projects. Um, and, uh, and then this last, over the last year, I don't think I have ever been involved in a larger planning process than what we did with Dr. Cog, which was where we developed our 10-year list. And our 10-year list, um, you know, we had a billion dollars or a half billion dollars in the first four years and then another half billion in the uh, second six years. And then we actually had four billion below the line, um, projects that couldn't even be funded if understanding that we didn't fund uh, years five through 10 of that uh, 10, 10 year list because we don't have that money. Um, and I think it's also um, important to note that uh, when we did the 2040 plan, for the first time ever, we added toll revenue to the actual um, selection of projects and what, how much uh, we had available to do projects on that plan. And so I think C470, I'll just point out, two thirds of the $300 million was paid for by toll revenue in that quarter. That's not a small amount. Um, and, it's, and it's actually a bit higher than that even. Um, so, you know, we did this huge planning effort with Dr. Cog over the, over the last year or so. We listened to all the local governments. Um, we took it to heart. The, you know, the lists didn't change a lot because we talked to our local governments a, a lot at CDOT. We really um, do value that relationship with the local governments and Dr. Cog. And so um, when we developed that list, we thought about um, regional equity. You know, we don't want all the projects up in Adams County or all of them in Denver. It's important to have a level of regional equity because there are problems all the way across the, uh, the CDOT Region 1 area and Dr. Cog. So we consider things like that as well. And we consider our um, CDOT Commission goals when we're also developing what projects make it into that plan. So I guess the good news just to close is I don't see that our 10-year list or the $4 billion of projects below the line is going to change a whole lot. Um, from that list to what we end up uh, working with Dr. Cog on. So I just wanted to uh, close out with that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Melinda, are there any other hands raised? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to put all hands down at this time, and then that way, in case there's any additional comments from the same people or uh, giving everyone one last opportunity to raise their hand. Uh, I'm going through the list. And at this time, I do not see any additional hands raised. Thank you. Uh, Jacob, I did have one question for clarification. Um, in your slide, you had shown local funded projects. Are the, are the amount that you're uh, soliciting from, ad, from, from the counties, are they to include locally funded projects also? Or if we know that those are gonna be locally funded, that those projects would just be added? to the RTP? 
Yeah, so that's a good question, Ken. So we have uh, traditionally in our regional transportation plan process given the opportunity, you know, regardless of whatever other parameters for project identification or solicitation, we've typically given the opportunity for locals to say, you know, if I have a project that maybe it's already in the RTP or maybe it isn't, but let's say it is and it's locally funded in the RTP, um, but I think it's a really great project. I think it could compete well at a regional level and I want to submit that as a candidate project. We've given that opportunity. Um, in some cases, I'm sure, can't think of a specific example at the moment, but I'm sure in some cases, you know, some of those projects have competed well and they've ended up uh, being in the fiscally constrained plan as what we call a regionally funded project, meaning, you know, federal or state um, or other non-local funds. Um, and sometimes, you know, maybe they truly are a local project and they end up, um, if they're included in the plan, being as a locally funded project. So what we're saying here is that we're, that, that's one of the proposed categories of, um, you know, when we think about um, how do we transition from 2040 to 2050, that if a local government has a locally funded project that they want to try and have compete as part of the solicitation, that they would have that option. So to, to summarize, then the local funded projects would be part of those 10? Yes, in the sense that, yes, if someone wanted to if someone wanted to submit what's in the 2040 plan as a locally funded project, that would be, if, if the number ends up being 10, that would be one of the 10 if they chose to, through the form, submit that um, as a candidate project for 2050, yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, should we move on? Let's move on. Okay, <laughs> let's start a conversation about project evaluation with the caveat that um, we know that there's more to be said here. And I think frankly, we've already started that conversation, but um, let's lay a couple of things out on the table. Um, this is again, uh, just for those who, you know, who were here six years ago when we did the 2040 plan. Um, and I hinted at this already last time we did a quantitative um, evaluation. Um, last time, you know, given how the process went and we as Dr. Cog staff were evaluating Dr. Cog um, some projects, you know, proposed to be funded with, with dollars that Dr. Cog controls. We evaluated about 60 projects or so. Um, and that was a very quantitative uh, evaluation, um, you know, months long process, you know, very detailed sort of um, scoring and analysis on, on several different factors. Um, and then again, as it, as it says here, a little bit of a simplification, but not simplification, but not overly so in the sense that once we did this very detailed project scoring and we came up with a point system um, and then we scored rank ordered those projects and went down the list until we ran out of money. Right. Um, and so that is one way of doing it. What we're proposing for 2050, as I've already hinted out, is more of a qualitative uh, evaluation. We think that worked well with the tip process. Um, so it would be pretty similar, and we'll get to that in the next slide or two of what we're, what we're proposing, but, um, but very much in, in broad strokes like we just went through uh, for the 2020 to 2023 TIP process. Um, again, I will say, you know, ending, you know, depending on where we end up on this, uh, whether it's this meeting or a future meeting, um, the more projects we have um, and the more sort of complex that gets, I really am going to advocate for a qualitative uh, scoring process as a way to get through that. And frankly, I think it's appropriate for a 30-year plan uh, when a lot of these projects, even projects in the 2040 plan, um, a lot of them, you know, end up being very conceptual, um, right? It's hard to it's hard to quantitatively evaluate a project that may not occur for 25 years. Um, so we think that we think the qualitative approach is a good one. Um, and let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about what we think that would look like. So we were going to go, just as kind of a discussion starter, um, this is another open-ended question. So what might the benefits be to using a qualitative evaluation from your perspective? You can type it in and it'll pop up. And then we'll have kind of a companion question right after this. All right, maintaining a focus on vision for projects beyond the tip, able to have more conceptual projects like Jacob said, 
not all projects, project benefits can be assigned a number, first level screening without too much effort, perhaps easier to consider factors that don't easily translate to quantitative measures, ease of evaluation, better regional outcomes, outcomes better tied to Metro Vision, better way to evaluate overall results, more projects in line with regional goals, linkage to Metro Vision objectives through a logical process, mode shift, easier to evaluate across all the projects. All right, so hearing lots of benefits to it. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one because it's kind of tied to it and then we can open it up for more discussion if we want. Uh, we got one more in alignment of local priorities with Metro Vision. All right, so the next question is, are, do you see any downsides to using a qualitative evaluation? What would they be? Harder to defend results and decisions. Process likely to be messy. You need both. It can be more subjective, will hide vast differences in projects, less objective, need to have clear criteria, less reliant on data, political influence, hard to connect with true performance-based planning, ideally a data-driven process, hard to ensure a cl clear, fair process. How can you evaluate air quality qualitatively? Harder to have a rationale to make the difficult choices for decision makers. Not fiscally constrained could lead to less realistic outcomes. Should this be done later when it can be more objective than subjective? All of the above. All right, Jacob, I'll throw this back to you to see if you want to open it up for discussion or if you want to move on to um, the next slide. Uh, no, I would like to open up for discussion. Those are very good comments on both the kind of pro and con. Uh, so we appreciate all that input. So I guess I'd ask if, um, if there's any hands raised for anything that's not already mentioned on these two uh, poll questions. Okay, Jacob, this is Melinda. Melinda. Um, I am not seeing any hands raised, but I guess we'll give everyone just a few more moments just to be safe. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, that's fine. Again, these are very good uh, input, and we'll take that back, so we appreciate it. Let's go ahead and move on. So as already mentioned, one part of that evaluation is going to be looking, could be looking at what our existing Metro Vision already says. So within that, we already have these five planning themes that have been established, and a lot of work has gone into what are those outcomes in each of them and what are those sub-objectives. So um, I just wanted to remind you all that of those five planning themes that we could be comparing these projects against. Yeah, thanks, Alvin. Um, and again, you know, sort of bottom line here in this sort of proposal from staff is using MetroVision as the basis for uh, qualitative evaluation. This is, as most of you know, what was done for the TIF. Um, the point I'd make here, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to read all these objectives individually. You can see them on the screen. Um, but the point I'd make here is that, um, you know, when we talk about MetroVision, when we've talked about MetroVision up to this point in the 2050 planning process, you know, we often focus on uh, the 13 or 15 or so sort of quantitative 2040 targets. You know, where does the region want to be by 2050 or now, or 2040 or now by 2050? And those are absolutely important. What we felt like though, at sort of the project level is that um, the objectives tell sort of a supporting but kind of wider story, a more, a more inclusive story about what are those things that are important. So this gets back to the framework um, that Eileen and some others have raised. This gets back to some of the earlier conversations we were having. We combed through MetroVision and we looked at every single objective and every single theme, and we thought about, 
you know, what are the objectives that are actionable in the sense that at at least a qualitative level, you know, we could, um, that they would be beneficial for, um, they could be useful for doing a, an evaluation of a project. Um, many objectives lend themselves to that. There's a few that, that would have been a harder link. Um, so what you're seeing on this slide, and then they say you can go to the next slide as well. Um, again, these are the objectives that from each of the themes in MetroVision that we're proposing um, that we would use if we, if we use a qualitative evaluation um, of candidate projects. And I think that when you look at these, when you take them cumulatively, they do relate back to the framework of scenarios. They relate back to the framework of priorities. They relate back to the framework of the proposed project types and categories that we talked about earlier. Um, again, these are things that, um, you know, reflective of the region's plan, you know, these are priorities in terms of what's important to us as a region um, about where we want to be by 2040 or 2050 and how, you know, individual projects can help us get there. Go ahead, next slide. All right, so in thinking about that, um, with those five Metro Vision themes, is there one or are, are there certain themes that kind of you see should have greater weight in, have, in being involved in this qualitative evaluation? You, this is a ranking question, so you're able to answer each one on the scale from none to low, medium, and high. Um, so you can go through each one of those and you kind of saw the examples of what the objectives are within each of those themes. So an efficient and predictable development pattern, a connected multimodal region, a safe and resilient natural and built environment, healthy, inclusive, and livable communities, a vibrant regional economy. Those are the five themes. You can rank those. All right, we're seeing some pretty pretty strong consistency with those bottom four, all ranking at 2.5, a little bit lower for the efficient and predictable development pattern choice. Um, but yeah, seeing seeing that those are all fairly high, or you're thinking that these those have fairly high weight in the qualitative evaluation. It's interesting. All right, that's our last Mentimeter for um, for this meeting, but let's, I will move back to the slides and pass it back to Jacob. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, and again, sorry, Jake, um, Jake, Jacob, sorry, this is Ron. I, just, I see that Eileen has her hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say before we move on, I do wanna offer um, anyone who has their hand raised. Okay, it looks like Eileen is self-muted. So Eileen, you have the ability to speak. I'm here. Um, can you go back to the multimodal region slide? That one, yeah. So I think that this is, um, I definitely understand um, the qualitative versus quantitative and the ease of using that. I think that this, this is where um, previous comments that came in about concerns about using qualitative evaluation. So this is, this has, what is this? Nine, a 10, 10 ish sub bullets about connected multimodal region. I think that's where a lot of us are going to struggle. And as a region, we could possibly struggle about, you know, improve and expand regions, multimodal transportation system service connections. But how does that compare to improve travel demand management services and strategies? So having these grouped all together is a little bit of a, I think that it's just kind of lobbying it out there, like, can we look at this a little bit more? Because, and I think this just goes back with 
you know, not being able to fund everything, but what 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 is going to make the biggest difference in our region? Just food for thought. Thank you, Eileen. Um, Jacob, do you want to respond, or are you going to take a look at these uh, in a little more depth between now and the next meeting? Um, I don't know that I have a ready response. I mean, I guess just to clarify your comment or your question, are you suggesting that um, taking just, for example, the connected multimodal region, that because there's 10 objectives here, are you suggesting that um, these, these 10 objectives maybe should be ranked in some way? I don't know the answer. I, and I think this, I mean, I keep harping back to my data framework about like what's the most important thing in this region to try to start tackling. Um, right. Understand. And I think it just goes back with like, okay, if, you know, if, if CDOT tosses something in there, if CDOT and, and, and Boulder County want to keep investing in, in 119, I'm bringing this up as a BRT, well, that's going to score well in the transit system. Yet if, right. you know, somebody in a different county wants to go do something about TDM, how, how do those compare? I think that that's where I'm not clear about how we would use a qualitative system to then bring these two, these you know various projects requests to one place and, and, and kind of evaluate equally. Yeah, I guess, so let me do respond with a couple of thoughts here and Ron, please tag on if you'd like to clarify. Um, I guess sort of, here's our initial thinking on this. And again, you know, that's why we're having this conversation. This isn't us trying to dictate. This is, here's a proposal. How do you all react? How can we make this better? But our initial thinking was a couple of things. One is that um, in using, if we used a qualitative sort of system like this, and again, you know, for those of you that just participate in the TIP process, think back to that. This is a lot of objectives here, and we're cognizant of that, right? But one thing that that does is it allows a good project, and that's what we're all looking for. What are these best regional projects? If there's a project that can tick, you know, making this up, six of these 10 in the transportation theme or seven of the 10, um, that sort of allows that, um, that allows that opportunity to sort of take place. We recognize that any given candidate project will be good in some things and not good at others. There's no magic bullet on any individual project, right? But the more that it, the more that an individual project can respond to um, these objectives, um, that seems like that should be a stronger project. So whether it's just within the uh, connected multimodal region theme or some of these other themes, you know, the more boxes that a project can tick on on these objectives, I think that's what we think we're looking for is these strongest sort of regional projects. I think our thought initially was that in going through this qualitative evaluation, if we do it this way, is that um, just like the tip, you know, we would sort of score these maybe a one through four, yes, no, whatever sort of appropriate uh, way to navigate through. Um, but again, when you start looking at the totality of these things, I think projects would start separating themselves. Thanks for that clarification. Thank you, Jacob. Any other hands raised, Melinda? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I do not see any other hands raised. Okay, Jacob, if okay. you would continue. Yep, believe it or not, we are on the last topic, and this is more um, this is more just kind of informational. I'm going to turn it over to Alvin. But uh, so the whole presentation, I've said, ignore the money, ignore the money, ignore the money. Now we're going to talk about money. So uh, probably not the best messaging on my part. But saying that facetiously, but in all seriousness, we did want to, you know, the financial plan is obviously a huge component of the 2050 plan. We've been doing a lot of work in the background. Uh, both here at Dr. Cog and working collaboratively with CDOT and RTD. We want to recognize that collaboration because just like the project work, the financial work really is a partnership. And we just wanted to show you some initial work in progress, very draft um, kind of calculations on the revenue side. And this is more about um, helping you absorb what the financial plan is because it's very complex. We can't just do it in one meeting. And it's about showing our work. So this is the beginning of a conversation that we're going to keep having over the next few months, but we really wanted to just start showing our work on some of these initial calculations. So Alvin. Thanks, Jacob. So these are just, uh, as he's mentioned, draft initial calculations. Ultimately, the final financial plan is going to include all the transportation revenue that we're expecting out to 2050. So that's federal, state, local, private money that we think can go towards improving the transportation system in the region. Uh, the summary table you're seeing here, um, obviously a summary version of the one that was included in your memo, but 
breaking down what those potential categories programs are, whether it's transit or roadway for CR or Dr. Cog. Um, we've broken it into those three staging periods that we're looking for in the RTP um, and then ultimately the total. Uh, we do want to point out that, again, just as these are initial calculations, these are also only looking at one part of the equation when we get into uh, fin the financial planning process. And uh, we haven't started looking at what those required and anticipated expenditures are. So while uh, we are throwing some tables with money at you right now, there are anticipated and required expenditures that we know are coming down through this process that is they're going to use up part of this money. We uh, are also aware that these are not all the sources of money that are available. These are just our first step after working with CDOT and RTD for the last couple of months to see what's potentially available out to 2050 uh, for our transportation system. Okay. Thank you. I have uh, one quick question for you, Yvonne. Alvin, uh, mm -hmm. did this include toll revenue or is it from CDOT or was this just uh, um, federal revenue? and state? This is a uh, federal and state money. Um, I'm not sure toll revenue was uh, an item within the program distribution we got at the moment. We're still working with CDOT to finalize a couple other categories that uh, we're expecting to be included within this financial doc, this t revenue table. Thank you. Are there, Melinda, are there any hands raised that would like to comment on this? Uh, we do actually have a hand raise. Uh, it looks like it is from Art Griffith. So Art, you can go ahead and speak. Yeah, so um, at least uh, here at Douglas County, we're really interested in where revenues are coming from and either in an appendix or within a short body of this document that you're going to produce. Um, where will we talk about what these revenue sources are and what percentages they are that make them up. In other words, are they property tax? Are they sales tax? Are they gas tax? You know, oh, about bear box too. I wouldn't want to forget that. But um, anyway, where are these revenues coming from? And could you just explain what are in these assumptions and these revenues for a minute here? Yeah, so Art, let me start that answer and then I'll turn it to Alvin. Just in the very big picture, um, yes, we will do exactly what you're suggesting in the sense that as part of the final 2050 um, RTP document, um, we're going to have a chapter devoted to those very questions. And we actually have a lot of federal requirements. We would do it anyway, but we have a lot of federal requirements around being pretty transparent of um, where's the money coming from? What are the different types of revenue sources? How are the actual amounts calculated? Um, you know, inflation rates, growth rates, um, getting into expenditures. I mean, there's just a whole complexity associated with this, which is why we wanted to give it to you all in bite-sized chunks. But we will be documenting all of those things so that people can understand uh, the financial picture of uh, when at the end of the day you see a smaller set of numbers, where did those numbers come from, and what are the assumptions behind those numbers. Um, having said that, Alvin, can you talk about the numbers on this slide? Uh, can you give a summary of where they come from? Yeah, no problem. So uh, we worked with both CDOT and RTD to get some documentation and start looking at what potential revenues there are. Um, on the CDOT side, uh, they provide us with the draft program distribution. So that includes how they're uh, breaking down money through categories and programs, uh, both on their side and then what we're looking at for Dr. Cog's sub-allocated money. Uh, when it comes to the transit side, uh, we work with RTD through their long-range financial plan and their midterm financial plan to see what money they've uh, they've got available through their own planning process out to 2040. And then um, in both the CDOT side and the RTD side, we started looking at what happens when you start projecting some of that money out past 2040 for our 2050 horizon year. So that includes um, money that's related to the base system, the fast track system, RTD side, it's fare box money, sales tax money. We're looking at what uh, FTA money is available in the region as well. So uh, we, we've worked with both CDOT and RTD to figure out uh, right now, what are those what are the sources of money we can capture right now? And we'll keep working with them to make sure we capture all of them out to 2050. Yeah, and, and Art, just in the agenda packet today, attachment number three uh, to this agenda item has more line item detail about the broad funding categories that roll up to these totals on your screen. And I'm sure they've taken out maybe some monies 
um, that go to operation and maintenance, um, at least with some assumptions, you know. Uh, again, this I've is covered the importance of, I don't want to say double spending money, but we've got to make sure we have, you know, what does it take to maintain things broken out separately? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Art. This and this is this is just the revenue side. This doesn't have and and again, as I mentioned earlier, speak to looking at sort of CDOT's part of the attachment number three. There's a whole maintenance and operations line item that totals what two point two point seven two point eight billion dollars over the next thirty years for asset management. So I mean there. This is mostly on the revenue side, but there's a program distribution conversation that happens where, you know, of all the revenues, what are the uses? And what, what ultimately we get to is of the sort of, in, in air quotes, the discretionary amount that's available to spend on improving or expanding the transportation system, what are those investment priorities that get reflected in the RTP? Yeah, so our, just to be really clear on that, these tables, we're just starting sort of how much revenue do we have conversation. We are not yet at the point at all of allocating these revenues to any specific expenditures. We're simply trying to get a handle on what revenues do we think we'll even have available for the planning period. Art, did that answer your question? Yeah, pretty good. I just think that, you know, there's a lot of information in here and you know, I think what Ron just said was like, this was available for programs and projects and things, but it's not intuitive that when I look at this sheet that it could include other maintenance and costs, you know, and I think, um, you know, it brings up the question, are we going to start funding maintenance or does that just track as a separate bucket? So. Keep those yeah, in we mind. Account, and, we we account for the we account for the in, the planned investments over the plan period in operations and maintenance of the system. Art we have we have to do that under federal law. We we don't just say oh there's going to be however many billions of dollars available and we're going to allocate those all to projects because that's not realistic. There's a big chunk of money. The vast majority of resources go to just maintaining and operating the existing transportation system. There's relatively less available to actually improve or expand the system. Thank you. Melinda, are there any other hands raised? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like uh, our next comment or question is from Bill Soroy. Bill, you have the ability to speak. Hi, this is Bill. I just wanted to, to add to that answer just because from some clarification on the transit side, I mean, from the revenue side, you know, typically if you look at us, we get about 60% of our revenues from sales tax, 20% from, you know, fare box, and about 20% from other. So that's just a, that's just something to understand in terms of what the assumptions moving forward. I generally, I would assume those percentages would hold on in the future. The other piece to this, just to build on what you said, Art, I think that. Um, you know, when we've done our long range planning, we have very limited ability to do anything on the capital side uh, through this first decade in this chart and start to get into to doing more capital, non maintenance, non operating revenue stuff um, beginning in 2030 um, through 2050. So th that's just some context to provide. Thank you, Bill. Are there any other hands raised, Melinda? Uh, at this time, I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. Okay. Jacob, do you have any more slides or comments on this item? Uh, not on this, uh, not on this slide. I think we have one last concluding slide. Okay. So I'm actually going to ask Ron to uh, maybe reflect on what we've heard today and kind of summarize next steps. Ron. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> So uh I've already put you on the spot, Ron. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Um You're welcome. I'm glad I was paying attention. Heard um a lot of really good feedback. Uh really appreciate that. Clearly, um there's work to do in general. I heard there's some areas where there's some agreement about sort of how to proceed and some areas that need some work. And uh we will go back 
and take the feedback we heard today. Um, just off the top of my head, I, I think that uh, some sort of work session um, over the course of the next three weeks, we'll look to see if we can schedule something uh, to uh, refine this based on what we've heard, have some further conversations, uh, bring back a, refi a re uh, revised uh, version of this in some sort of work session um, setting uh, to finalize the conversation around this and move us forward. But I appreciate everybody's um, feedback on this and uh, the level of discussion and engagement. I know um, it was messy, and I will. I don't mind messy because I think ultimately we get to a better, better end product and better agreements uh, when we actually have a full dialogue. And sometimes that dialogue can be messy. So I just I really appreciate everyone's um, feedback and participation in this. Thank you. Um, does that conclude your presentation then, Ron and Jacob? Yes, it does. And again, we really appreciate everyone's input today. It's really helpful. So thank you. Yeah, thank you to everyone for your input on that. Before we move on to our next informational briefing, um, I was reminded that we uh, uh, I needed to ask if anybody had um, changes to the April 27, 2020 tax meeting summary. And if you do or have comment on that, would you please raise your hand? And I'll give you a few moments here and then, Melinda, if you'll let me know. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll just give everyone a moment just in case. Okay, um, I am not seeing any hands raised at this time. Then the uh, the meeting summary will stand as presented. Thank you. So now we'll move on to a presentation. I believe, Ron, you're leading this on the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program, the COVID-19 impacts. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think since we're, we're over two hours um, and out of uh, expediency, I would, respectfully suggest that I'm going to hit a couple of highlights of this and uh, maybe defer this to the next TAC agent TAC meeting so we can have a little bit more conversation about it because I do want to I don't want to do a disservice and shortchange this topic because it is important so I will spend maybe two minutes quickly introducing the topic refer you to the staff memo and the information that we included in the packet today and suggest that we bring this back for more of a conversation with TAC at the next TAC meeting. Um, so um, just my the, the three minutes version of this is obviously um, you all are seeing the significant um, budget impacts because of the uh, economic impacts of coronavirus and the response to COVID-19. Uh, while that impact, the full extent and depth and length of those impacts is still quite a bit uncertain. We are starting to get a feel for some of those impacts um, and have tried to, at least on uh, the um, state shared revenue through the Highway Users Tax Fund, HUTF revenue that's shared between CDOT and cities and counties. Um, there is an estimate based on the most recent state estimate of HUTF impacts attached to this packet so you can um, look and see sort of what that might be over the next couple of years. But we also know that there's a lot of other local revenues that go into funding your local transportation systems to varying degrees, including things like sales taxes and local use taxes, um, property taxes, car rental fees, lodging taxes, et cetera, et cetera, all those things that um, can also um, be used and are used to varying degrees by local jurisdictions to help fund. Um, we have a significant commitment from you all in terms of local match for federally funded projects allocated to the Transportation Improvement Program. So um, it's our contention that there's a shared benefit to making sure that we can keep those program federal dollars flowing as much as possible and as quickly as possible to help contribute to and sustain economic activity over the next couple of years as we recover from um, the coronavirus situation now. So uh, the staff memo just includes a couple of potential um, options for both acknowledging and responding to 
um, economic financial hardships that any local jurisdictions might be experiencing or experience over the next year or two and how we might deal with those uh, through some uh, policy options that we either can control or can influence. So the first one, evaluating sort of our delay policy and waiver and uh, perhaps identifying some opportunities to um, extend the delay policy um, under a financial hardship um, case for local sponsors, reprogramming federal funds and allowing projects, local project sponsors to propose to delay uh, program funds and allow other sponsors that might be in a better position to take advantage of that freed up programming dollars uh, for projects that might be ready. Um, again, depending on um, how extensive and the different ways that uh, local jurisdictions are being impacted. And then there's also some opportunities to look at uh, with um, CDOT's cooperation. Uh, they, they are looking uh, very much at opportunities to utilize state toll credits. Um, I'll have some more information um, available, um, but essentially toll credits are a way to increase the federal share of a federally funded project from um, typically 80% to up to 100% federal uh, funding for a, for a project. The challenge is that it doesn't actually bring new dollars uh, to the project. So um, there are a couple of, you can reduce the scope of the project down to the amount of federal funds that have been programmed. That's obviously a challenge and may not work for, for a project or finding other federal funds to help um, fill that gap and still um, use toll credits to make a project 100% funded. So again, a very brief introduction to the topic. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd suggest that we come back when we have more time to discuss this at the next tech meeting. Um, that sounds like a, a good plan, Ron. So we'll take up this item at the next uh, TAC meeting with some more information you're providing. Um, with that, we'll move on to uh, item seven, federal planning certification review and request for comments. Ron? Yep, uh, real quick item. Uh, Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration have kicked off um, the quadrennial planning certification process. So they are required to certify that the transportation planning process meets federal requirements at least every four years. Uh, so this is uh, our cycle to do that. Um, they are working on a review of the transportation planning process for the Denver metropolitan area uh, that's conducted by Dr. Cog as the MPO, uh, along with CDOT, RTD, and our local government um, member jurisdictions. And I would be happy if Aaron or Aaron uh, Busto with FHWA or Kristen Kenyon from FTA wanted to speak to this, but there's an opportunity. Obviously, we would all welcome any spe specific feedback or comments from any of the partner agencies in the planning process, and you can certainly make any comments today um, or send uh, specific comments to either Aaron or Kristen and their email addresses are provided in the staff report. So uh, Mr. Chair, if Aaron or Kristen want to make any comments, I'd suggest uh, making that available to them. That that would be great. Aaron or Kristen, if you would like to make a comment, um, please let us know by raising your hand or and we'll unmute you. Uh, Ron, when do you need comments in? Is there a date specific? I, I don't think there's a, Kristen can, or Aaron can correct me, I don't think there's a date specific, but I hopefully, you know, could, could com get comments sometime by the middle or end of June, I think would be a reasonable target. Okay, thank you. So Aaron or Kristen, did you have comments? And Melinda, you probably need to unmute them. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kristen and Aaron, you both have the ability to speak if you would like to. I see Bill Haas's hand up to you, Melinda. Yes. Um, okay, I can go ahead. Uh, all right, Bill, you are able to speak if you'd like. Hi, uh, Bill Haas, uh, Federal Highways, Colorado Division Office. Um, I don't think Kristen is able to um, uh, speak through this. Um, 
platform. So, um, and I'm not sure if Aaron's on the call, but I just I'm here. wanted to, oh, okay, Aaron, go ahead then. Oh, thank you. So uh, Ron gave a great primer of the certification review. We do this every four years and we look at everything involved in the regional transportation planning process, including all of the different partners. So this isn't just specifically a review of Dr. Cog, it is a review of how the regional transportation process takes place in the Denver metro area. Um, so we are looking at everybody, we're including everybody. If you scroll down in the agenda, uh, we do have a public announcement page and we are looking in the middle of June to get comments back, but um, we're always available. You know, we attend these meetings regularly and, and you can contact us through email um, or our phone numbers on our website. So yeah, we're available for comments and look forward to hearing from everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron and Bill. You said Kristen was unable to, to, to speak on this forum. Uh, no, Kristen has the ability. She uh, she actually just uh, wrote me a comment saying that she didn't have anything to add and that end of June would be nice for uh, those comments. Um, but we do have one additional hand raise from uh, Alex Heidright. Uh, okay. Alex, Alex, do you have the ability to speak? Hi, uh, this is Alex Heidright with Boulder County. Um, I actually had a question on the last agenda item. Um, if we're tabling the COVID impacts to the next tech meeting, I was wondering if in the packet for next month, there could be a little bit more background information on the toll credits included. Because I'll admit, I have next to no understanding of how those would work with the federal share. And I was just wondering if we could have a little more information for our um, for the packet next month. Yeah, for sure, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, hearing no more uh, comments or hands raised, or and Melinda, no hands raised, uh, we'll move on to item eight. And uh, Carson, would you give us an update on the AMP working group update? And Melinda, you'll need to unmute him. Sure, it looks like I'm unmuted. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll keep it short because I know we're running late here. The AMP working group did not meet as a whole this last month, but instead used the time allotted to kick off a series of focus group steering committees, I think is what they're called, centered on three main kind of topical buckets that the tactical actions from Mobility Choice Blueprint fell into. Those three buckets are data and data sharing, shared mobility, and system operations. Each of the committees will identify next steps for more tangible actions to be taken out of each of the tactical actions from the Mobility Choice Blueprint that we've been prioritizing as a working group. If you have an interest in joining any of these focus group steering committees under these three buckets, uh, please let me or Emily Lindsay know, and I'm sure they would appreciate your valuable insights. And I think that's all for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Carson. Um, are there any other member comments or other matters that need to come before the TAC? Uh, if so, please raise your hand. And Melinda, would you let me know if hands are raised? Uh, yes, absolutely. It looks like uh, we do have one hand raised. It's from Eileen Yazzie. Eileen, go ahead. Yes, um, <clears throat> this will be my last question or comment for the day, so thank you. Um, just wondering if on um, the next uh, Transportation Advisory Committee meeting, if there could be an update on the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvements Program. I believe we can do that. Eileen. That would be helpful. I think that we've been, at least Denver's been hearing about some possible fiscal impacts and possible some uh, change to the program and then just looking for an update on the timeline as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, Melinda, or hands raised? Uh, at this time, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Then um, our next meeting will be June 22nd. And as I understand it, Ron, you're going to be setting up a, uh, a work, working meeting to further discuss item five that we had today. And yes, uh, with that, um, we're adjourned at 3.54. Thank you.